Uh, thank you for the panel for arriving. I suppose we're here to talk about probably the most important aspect of the IB game journey, the preparation and the integration. Um, unfortunately, it tends to be something that is somewhat dismissed by many people within the IB game industry because it is not essentially the most profitable part of uh, IB game treatments. You know, so what we're here to do is talk about the importance of allowing clients who go through the come IB game on, on, to on. get the proper support. This is not about people going to an IV game treatment to just receive the medicine. We've got to be able to do more for them. We've got to set them up and we've got to integrate them and we've got to support them. Otherwise, we're doing a disservice to our clients. We're doing a disservice to ourselves and we're doing a disservice to IV game. With that in mind, I would like to introduce Dr. Sue Nielsen who's been working with the Universal Ivy again, and um, she has a, a lot to say to begin with. So I, I'd like to go to Sue, please. Thank you, Anders. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce myself a little bit and give you just a brief history of my story. Um, I'm a family physician, and um, during the course of my medical school, I had an injury and someone prescribed me opioids, and um, I liked it a little bit too much from the get-go <laughs> and over a period of about 15 years, very slowly, very insidiously, I ended up taking it pretty much towards the very end of my family practice career every night after work. Um, I figured, well, if people are drinking wine after work, I could take a Vicodin after work. Um, and then... It was also a time when Big Pharma was really pushing OxyContin and all the other opioids and the pain advocates were saying, hey, treat the patient's pain, assess the pain, treat the pain. But the pain advocates were telling us physicians that we needed to assess everybody's pain, we needed to treat everybody's pain. And so therefore people became asking for opioids quite a bit. And they told us that if no one, if the person, the patient didn't have an addiction history, the risk of opioids was very small. And I bought into that thinking that I could handle it, I could use it and not get addicted. Well, so wrong, not true. Um, then I had some major trauma around 2010, 2012. I won't go into that, but I decided to leave medicine. I was very disillusioned and I left medicine. I got divorced, I quit my job, I moved to Florida and then I found uh, the Florida very easy to get pain meds. And so given that I had a pain syndrome, at least I felt I did. I got on a lot of opioids, uh, given that the constraints of my practice were now over and kind of went into a hole with that. Then tried to use Subutex to get off, which that didn't work. Um, and so eventually I just did a lot of research and I found through Gabor Mate, I met Gabor Mate and he told me about Ibogaine. I'd never heard about it before, I researched it. Unfortunately, all the stuff on the internet is very rose-colored glasses regarding Ibogaine. Um, I did get in contact with an Ibogaine clinic in Mexico. They uh, had me get on morphine for two months, um, which supposedly was going to be enough. And I've heard it many times on this thing that you can wean somebody off Subutex for two weeks or a month, and it's simply not true. When I went down to my Ibogaine clinic, I still had buprenorphine in my urine at two months. So my Ibogaine experience was not fun, to say the least. Uh, it was definitely interesting, um, but I went into very severe withdrawals at about eight hours into it and was miserable for 12 hours easily. And so it's kind of my soapbox is, really cannot detox people off of Subutex in a short period of time. This is kind of like some of the pre-work that people need to do. If someone's on Subutex, give them at least three months of morphine before you even send them, make sure their urine is clean. Um, and I did some of my own pre-care, but I really didn't get any like well-defined pre-care. I did it myself through yoga, meditation, but I still was not prepared. 
I, I didn't get it. And this is kind of my thing is that I, now that I know I didn't get any pre-care, I didn't get any aftercare, I see how important it, it would have been for me. I would have been much more prepared for the experience. Um, I thought it was gonna be easy. It was not easy, <laughs> not in this, any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I had a very little bit of aftercare from a nice counselor in the Ibogaine community, but not anything like I should have gotten. And so three things, definitely pre-treatment, pre-screening, proper preparation, drop the expectations about what's gonna happen, um, be prepared for the worst. It might not be that bad, but be prepared for it. Um, and then definitely aftercare would have been great to have. Um, so, and I, because of my experience, because I was a physician who was opioid dependent, who did ibogaine, I came back afterwards and I, and I wrote a book about it. And it's called um, Denying Addiction. And it's, it's basically my whole story, my own personal story, and a little bit of education of how people become, uh, you know, substance users in the beginning. It's definitely why, not why the drug, it's why the pain, as Herpo Hundial said. It's why the pain, it could be psychological pain because I'm sure that my physical pain was a manifestation of my psychological pain. And so strongly suggest kind of cracking the egg is, or cracking, cracking it down a little bit. Andrews will talk more about that, but cracking people open so they know why they started using in the first place. And uh, I had to figure that out for myself, but it would have been nice to have a guide to help me with that. So again, if, um, Anybody has any questions after this panel, I'd be happy to answer, but that's my five minutes. I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing to say, and I, I, you know, this is incredibly important, is Ibogaine is not a magic bullet for addiction. Uh, relapse rates are incredibly high for those who don't approach their treatment with the appropriate intentionality and integrity and preparation. Um, you know, Ibogaine and other psychedelics can be used. They're essentially tools to become more connected and comfortable with who we are. This is the important thing about them. You know, you take Ibogaine, you don't wake up as a Thurman or George Clooney. You wake up as yourself. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is that addiction is not the problem. It never has been. The addiction is a symptom of a profound and deep psycho-spiritual malaise which people are self-medicating upon. So we have a moral duty to help our clients discover why they are self-medicating, what the cultural narratives are, what the familial societal narratives are behind them feeling inauthentic. Because essentially for me, and I don't know if anybody else agrees, but Addiction can really be defined by this idea that you're self-medicating against feeling inauthentic to begin with. Um, that inauthenticity is normally because you've been conditioned not to like yourself at a very, 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 very young age. Um, we become actors at a very, very young age to be able to survive the environments we're in. Um, and if we don't look at that initial trauma, if we don't help the clients do that, um, if we don't prepare them to have an understanding of their shadow of their inner child so that when they integrate the Ibogaine experience, they at least know where they're going and what they're doing, we're failing our clients. Any Ibogaine clinic that allows people to just turn up without pre-treatment and post-treatment is doing an incredible disservice to them, incredible disservice to the industry and an incredible disservice to Ibogaine. Um, you know, we are not looking for just another detox. That is not enough. We have to be there. We have to be available. We have to provide communitas for our clients. You know, that's what it's all about. For me, what worries me about the revolution going on at the moment is that maybe profits are more important than healing. And I think this is what this discussion should be about because pre-treatment and post-treatment is ensuring that we look after the client. The client is the most important person, not the profit line. 
Um, and that's where I'm, I'm, I'm sticking here. I mean, I don't know, we could talk about modality, we could talk about protocols, but for me, I think the most important thing is, is about providing the client with really the best chance of making something of their lives, the really best chance of getting to know who they are. And I began as the most fantastic tool to catapult people into discovering who they are and enjoying life and liking themselves. Um, but if we don't help them, if we just give them I began and then throw them out into the street after, well, it's a pretty shitty thing to do. That's me done. Thank you. Um just I want to just jump in and say something to take to take off on that. Uh, so something that's also really important when we're talking about it's got to be about the client and it can't be about the profits. It also can't be about restoring people to productivity. Like productivity and success can't be our main goal for the people that we're working with. It also has to be enjoying yourself and just learning how to have fun. A lot of people after I began have no idea how to have fun and enjoy themselves. And they're so focused on working hard and, you know, I got to do this for my career. I have to fix this. And it's all about this capitalist notion of productivity. We have to root that out of the work that we're doing with Ibogaine. This is not about making people better capitalists. This has got to be about making people better with themselves for whatever they want. And so, you know, a lot of what I do when I work with people before and afterwards is to help them relearn how to have fun, how to have friends, what they even enjoy doing, because people don't even know what they enjoy doing. And this doesn't necessarily have to be about accomplishing things and accomplishing goals. It's okay to just do nothing and fucking relax, you know, um, part of my language. But I just wanted to point that out just to take off on that. By the way, I'm Juliana. I run Intervision I Begin. I used to be a provider. Um, also, like Sue, former opioid user. Um, so yeah. Just wanted to interject and say that. So I wanted to jump in and add on what Juliana was saying too. So basically, you know, after you've completed treatment, I mean, with drug addiction, it's such a ritualistic experience. So you take everything from going to the streets and buying the drugs or consuming them. There's it's a ritualistic process. So once you get clean, I think like one of the most important things too is replacing it with new healthy rituals. Because if there's just a gaping void, you're always gonna go back to it because there's so, you get so much out of that ritual. I mean, I'm a former heroin addict and an Oxycontin addict myself. And, you know, I remember before I would even go out and, and do the drugs that, you know, I would get a rush just knowing that I was going to get them. So it has to be replaced with new healthy rituals and, you know, trying to really focus on like long lost dreams, long lost passions that got kicked to the back burner for drug addiction, uh, because there will be this gaping hole and like having something that you can truly connect with, whether that's, you know, volunteering at an animal shelter or, you know, going out with your friends and socializing in a, in, in a sober setting, but there has to be structures in place afterwards. And, you know, developing those rituals are so important. You know, something like meditation, having those daily spiritual practices to really help you integrate and step out of that addictive structure. But there has to be something in place. You can't just take it away and leave a void because you will go back. <laughs>